Why don't we go ahead and start? Do you know what a change in ownership is? Do you know what Prop 13 is? Do you know what Prop 13 is? Okay, a change in ownership is a gift that keeps on giving. Now, I've heard that term before. It's not a very good term, but you have to think about it that way because once you trigger a change in ownership, your property taxes are going to forever go up from wherever they were. Let's say you're paying taxes on $100,000 a year, roughly $1,200 with the, the direct assessments, and you have a change in ownership, and that house was last bought in 1970s. What is it worth today? $1.5 million? Your taxes just went up from $12,000 to $17,000 a year. And once you start dealing with commercial industrial property, you just move that decimal point and those commas over, right? So if you trigger a change in ownership, you're going to get a forever increase in your property taxes that is very hard to undo. So what do we do about it? Well, you can do a couple of things. One is try not to have a change in ownership. And I think Wes's comments earlier are, are, are kind of illustrative of that. If you do think certain acts, they're gonna, your property's gonna get reassessed. So Prop 13 said no increases in your property taxes unless you do a change in ownership or new construction. Wes was talking about new construction. I'm gonna talk about change in ownership. Change in ownership is defined in section 60 of the RT code. Blah, 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 statutes, is he gonna read statutes? No, I'm not gonna read statutes, but, well, there might be some in there later, but that's another story. It, essentially, it's a transfer of a present beneficial interest that's substantially equivalent to fee. Okay, that, that's interesting. So what is a transfer of a present interest? For the non-lawyers out there, that means you have a present right to access the property and use it present right to the income from that property right now. You're a trust beneficiary, that means you have a present interest. Um, you own the property and you're collecting the rents, you have a present interest. It's not, a, it, you contrast that with future interests like my parents trust, so when they pass away, the trust is gonna go to Michael and Gabriel, right? But I don't have a present interest in that home right now. I have a future interest or a contingent interest. Beneficial use includes the right to occupy the real estate, receive income from it, generally speaking, if you can get income from the property or you can occupy it, it's a present interest, I mean a beneficial use. Substantially equivalent to fee uh, has several meanings in the statute. One of the most interesting to me is a fee simple, I'm sorry, a life estate. Do you know what a life estate is? Life estate to, to Michael for life, then the remainder to his kids. That means I can live in the property for as long as I want. No matter how old I am, that life estate is equivalent to a fee interest. I could be 90 and on my deathbed, and I'd still have a fee interest in property. Um, that was a court case out of um, San Francisco a few years ago, I believe it was Riley. Anyways, uh, some things to think about. If you see the word rule up here, that is a vernacular. It stands for a property tax rule promulgated by the State Board of Equalization. Uh, again, I don't want to distance myself too far from Wes's comments. I didn't help write all the laws, I helped write some of them, and helped write some of the administrative interpretations of them. Uh, but a property tax rule is a, a regulation promulgated by the Board of Equalization. For you lawyers out there, California Code of Regulations, Title 18, and then the section number is the rule number. But if you go into the county assessor's office and you say 18 CCR 462.040, they're gonna go, huh? You tell them property tax rule 462.040, oh, they'll go, okay, I understand that. So, present, beneficial use, uh, substantially equivalent to the fee. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, one thing before I talk about this slide, when you change, um, when you sign a deed to property, what do you do? You sign the deed, you receive a deed, or someone goes and records it for you. Anytime you put a deed in for a piece of real estate at the county recorder's office, it's gonna be presumed to be a change in ownership. A lot of people don't get that. Well, I deeded it to my family LLC. Well, yeah, you did. That's a deed. And anytime you transfer property by deed, that's presumed to be a change in ownership and you have to argue against that. And there's some ways to do that. A couple of types of properties that property is held when you're holding title to real estate. Uh, do you know what a deed is, right? Uh, so when I think of a deed or title to real estate, I usually bring in a, a mason can, a mason jar full of dirt. Title to dirt. Do I have a, a tenant in interest, tenant in common interest in dirt, or do I have a legal entity interest in a legal entity? I mean, in an LLC that owns the dirt. That's the question you have to ask yourself. What transferred? When you're transferring dirt, 
you're signing a deed, recording it, or unrecording for that matter, that deed is a change in ownership unless you qualify for an exclusion. So two common ways that real property is held when you're holding title to dirt is tenancy in common and joint tenancy interests. These are the two different styles. Tenancy in common is any proportion. You can have a 5% tenancy in common interest or a 95%. Uh, all it refers to is common ownership by multiple persons, real or corp you know, corporate, um, and you have uh, you know, legal title to, to real estate. Uh, anytime, there's no right of survivorship for tenancy in common. You can give it away. There's no uh, automatic passing to your heirs. And whenever you record a deed that transfers a tenancy in common interest, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's presumed to be a change in ownership unless you qualify for an exclusion. There's another way to hold real estate through joint tenancy. It's not a very popular way any longer, although people who are unsophisticated use it as a uh, estate planning tool. In law school, we call about the four unities, unity of time, title, interest, and right. Everybody who's a joint tenant has the right to occupy it. Everybody who's a joint tenant acquires their title at the same time. They all have equal interests. And one of the things that's element of, of the joint tenancy is you have a right of survivorship. If there's four people who hold a joint tenancy interest to, to real property, what happens when one dies? Their 25% interest is effectively transferred to the other three remaining joint tenants. And until the last person dies, or the second to last person, those interests keep getting automatically transferred to the other persons, until there's one person. Um, there's a, not a change in ownership if a transferee is a joint tenant who is an original transfer. This has to do with a really obscure uh, method of holding real title, real prop, title to real property that the legislature put in there to accommodate people who use joint tenancies as estate planning tools. Let's use an example here. Aunt and uncle, right? They have the niece that moves in with them to take care of them while they're old, and they decide they want to leave the house to the niece. What are you going to do? Well, they're not sophisticated, so they went down to the uh, stationery store, got a joint tenancy deed, aunt and uncle to aunt, uncle, and niece as joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Do you think that the aunt and uncle intended to give their niece present title to real estate? No. They just want her to have it when she passes away. And so when, that, when they do that, they get this title called original transfer war. And the legislature created a special rule that says, Okay, if you, did, if you have this status, um, if you're the grantors in that situation, aunt and uncle, uh, we don't want to reassess it until the last one of those two original grantors passes away. I've got an 80-page version of these slides. I'll be happy to go, with them, go through them with you over the phone. Uh, just let me know. Um, it's not very popular, and most of you in this room won't ever do it. It's just something I'd like to talk about because it's still out there. Let's go on. Uh, certain transfers of tenancies and common interests are not changes in ownership. Uh, one of them is called a partition. A partition is a sophisticated tool by which two people who hold a tenancy and common interest physically partition the property and take a respective interest in the property. Let's say two people hold a piece of real estate 50-50. It's a 15, you know, 20-acre farm in the middle of the California. And they, they're not getting along anymore. They can go to court or they can physically partition it between the two of them so that one of them takes 10 acres and one of them takes the other 10 acres. Not a change in ownership as long as the interest that each receives is equal to their proportionate interest in the real property. Um, transfers from co-tenancy to joint tenancy, I'm not gonna talk about that. Proportional interest transfers I'll talk about in a few minutes. This is the only way you can give property to a legal entity without reassessment or distribute it from the legal entity without reassessment. Interspousal transfers, if you're transferring real estate between spouses, there's no change in ownership or registered domestic partners on the old program, uh, and grandparent, grandchild, under and parent-child exclusion under specific circumstances. Again, uh, since this is more directed toward the business community, I'm not gonna talk about the uh, parent-child exclusion much. Uh, if you just ask me afterwards and we'll, we can talk about it. Let's move on. Joint tenancies. Uh, the four unities I talked about a few minutes ago with the key is the right of survivorship. Let's go to the next slide. The general rule is that if you create a joint tenancy, it's a change in ownership at the time of its creation. Now, here's, here's what I mean by that. You have unrelated third party transferring a joint tenancy interest to a husband and wife. 
Is there any relationship between that third party and the husband and wife before? Not likely. Let's say they went to, they bought the house, right? If there's no prior relationship, then the creation of the joint tenancy is a change in ownership. On the other hand, you're already on title, aunt and uncle who owned it, conveying it to themselves and their niece as joint tenants, that is excluded because aunt and uncle who were on title before remain as joint tenants thereafter. That's the exception that's listed there. Okay, aunt and uncle conveying it to aunt, uncle, and niece as joint tenants. Aunt and uncle become original transferors. According to the regulation, uh, niece is what they call an ot ot, other than original transferor. No one's really, you know, when you're dealing with the property tax acronyms, they don't always make sense. Ot ots. Just wait till we get to original co owners. Okay. The termination of any joint tenancy interest is a change in ownership unless it vests back into at least one original transferor. So let's take a look at our aunt and uncle hypo, right? Aunt and uncle to nie aunt, uncle and niece as joint tenants. What's the most likely scenario in that situation? Uncle passes away. What happens? Uncle's interests pass to who? Back, half, back to, you know, half back to his wife and half back to his niece, right? But aunt is what they call an original transferor. She's still on title. We don't reassess it then. But we do reassess it when all the original transferors drop off. Let's move on. Okay, trusts. Everyone hears about how you need a trust. And you need a trust if you hold real estate or you need to use legal entities. But generally speaking, you need to use, hold it in a trust. But California treats trusts differently than it does, I mean, treats trusts in a very unique manner. When you think of a trust, you're thinking about transferring property to a trustee who holds it for the benefit of the beneficiaries, right? Who, does the trustee have ownership of that real estate? Yes, they have bare legal title, but they can't exercise it for their own behalf. They have to exercise it on the behalf of their beneficiaries, right? So the trustee lists it or rents it out and collects the rents and typically distributes it to the beneficiaries. So we give bare legal title to somebody but they, in many cases, don't hold any beneficial ownership of it, do we? Who does? It's a beneficiary. So in trusts, you look right through the trust as if it's not there. Who are the beneficiaries of that trust? Sometimes, if it's a revocable trust, it's the person or the trustor who created that trust because they can revoke it and take it back at any time. The trustee, well, if they're also a beneficiary, yes, they have some beneficial ownership, but if they are a non-beneficiary trustee, they don't have any beneficial ownership. We have to look through it to see who is a present beneficiary. I could create a trust for the benefit of my daughters, Elizabeth and Ariana, but if I make HSBC the trustee, does HBSC own the property? No, but they'll, they'll gladly do that for a fee, right? But who really owns it? It's my daughters, Ariana and Elizabeth. We figured if we were those you know, three more kids, there would be an I, and O, and a Q. Sorry. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, so the key thing is to look through the trust to who is the present beneficiary of that trust. And any time the present beneficiary of that trust changes, you're going to have a change in ownership, unless you qualify for an exclusion, right? So mom and dad put the property in the trust. It's a revocable trust. But what happens when someone dies? That trust typically becomes irrevocable. The interest either goes to the surviving spouse or to the kids or to both. And we have to look at where did the property go. Okay? Uh, this is an example of a parent-child exclusion. Uh, again, this is a business-oriented uh, discussion, so I'm going to skip this slide. But generally speaking, when you have share insurance like provisions in a trust, and the house, one child wants the house, you need to take some special steps, and I can explain them to you offline. Uh, this is another example dealing with a parent-child exclusion, but this one's kind of interesting, so I'm gonna talk about it. This one has to do with a girlfriend. Is there a girlfriend exclusion in California? No. So, mom and dad are divorced, dad creates a trust, he's got a couple of kids, and, and later in life, he's got a girlfriend. And so, dad, you know, creates this trust, the house goes to my girlfriend for life, and then the balance to my kids once she passes away. But there isn't a girlfriend exclusion, so what happens when dad dies? We have a transfer from dad to girlfriend of a present interest, the right to occupy a piece of real estate, right? So that's a change in ownership. 
There's no girlfriend exclusion, so the county assessor has to reassess the property, right? Oh, what happens? A dies, the, the trust becomes irrevocable, the girlfriend's the owner because, for property tax purposes because she has a life estate. Then A I mean, the A's girlfriend dies. What happens? The balance goes to A's kids. Well, who's the transfer in that situation? Is it the girlfriend? Who caused the property to be transferred to the kids? Dad did, because dad funded the trust. And it was dad's instructions that the home, once girlfriend dies, goes to the kids. So dad is the transferor. And then you can go in and claim what? The parent-child exclusion, which I'm not going to talk about, which I just talked about. <laughs> but there's another wrinkle. You don't get dad's tax bases back. They inherit girlfriend's tax bases. It's not, it's not rocket science, but it's not pretty sometimes either. <laughs> okay. Now, remember our question before, what transferred? You have to ask yourself, whenever you're looking at these situations, what changed hands? Title to dirt, or shares of legal, in, or membership interest in a legal entity, or shares of stock? Why do you have to ask yourself that question? Because that's the first fork in your decision tree. Do you go left or do you go right? If you go right and you say it's a, change, it's a transfer of a title to real estate, well, we talked about that. It's presumed to be a change in ownership unless you qualify for an exclusion. What if you go left and it's a transfer of a legal entity interest? I'll give you a hint, a little bit of foreshadowing here. If you go left and it's a transfer of a legal entity interest, it's not a change in ownership subject to two giant exceptions that eat the rule sometimes. Let's move on. The first question is, transfers of title to dirt to or from a legal entity, legal entity as grantor or legal entity as grantee are presumed to be changes in ownership. Section 61J of the R&T Code. So anytime a grantee or grantor on a deed is a legal entity, it's presumed to be a change in ownership unless you qualify for an exclusion. Got it? There's only two potential exclusions. Number two, affiliated corporations. I'm not even going to talk about today because both of them have to be corporations and you have to have common ownership all the way to the top. Oh wait, I just talked about it. Mm. Okay. The one that we're really interested in here is number one, the proportional interest exclusion, section 62A2. Uh, but here's something else worth noting. When you have a transfer to or from a legal entity, there is no interspousal exclusion and no parent-child exclusion. I'm generalizing there. You do get an interspousal exclusion if it's a divorce situation, but I'm not talking about that. But generally speaking, if you have husband and wife, 50% owners of a piece of real estate, and you convey it to the legal entity owned solely by the husband, that's a change in ownership. There's no interspousal exclusion. Let's move on. Okay. I told you I wasn't going to read the statute. What's that? Oh my goodness. That's a, I'm not going to read that. Move on. Okay, here's the thing. When you're transferring real property to or from a legal entity, the important thing is it has to be proportional. If it is proportional, then you can qualify for an exclusion under Section 62A2. And by proportional, what do I mean? I mean that the persons who have signed the deed as grantor have to own the grantee in the exact same proportions. If it's 95-5 on this side, Michael is to 95, Ariana is to 5 as the grantor, and the LLC has to be owned in the exact same percentages by Michael and Ariana, 95-5. Make sense? You have to mirror it perfectly. If you deviate by a half a percent, it's a change in ownership. Okay, uh, section 62A2 is a primary exclusion to getting real property to a legal entity, uh, real property to a legal entity, or for distributing real property out of the legal entity back to its members or shareholders. Uh, disproportionate, even as to 1%, or even as to a fraction of 1%, is going to trigger a 100% reassessment. Draconian, I know, but it's the way it is. And you can correct some of these things. Uh, it's getting a little bit easier now in LA County. You can either rebut the deed presumption and say that somebody didn't ha really have title to the real property and, uh, who signed the deed, or you can try to rescind it. Um, LA County was really tough on rescissions for a very long time. They've backed off of that slightly. Rescission means completely undo the transaction, say, 
uh, the, everybody signed the deed saying we rescind this transfer, you have to give all the money back, the real estate has to be given back to the people who contributed it. Uh, it, it's a messy process, but it's possible to return the property back to its original uh, tax basis by doing that. But you only get prospective relief. Um, once you've triggered a disproportionate change in ownership, you're stuck with it. Am I keeping you too long? I, since I, I do have your attention, I, I, I really want to talk about these things because so often people come to me with uh, botched contributions to LLCs where the attorney told them, hey, this, this, this isn't gonna get reassessed, everything was proportional, and they didn't look, or they didn't know to look. And roughly uh, one hour of my time or less, I could have saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars by just talking to me or somebody like me who knows this stuff. It doesn't take much to really screw this up. Let's move on. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, contributions and distributions. Uh, brothers A and B own six lots as tenants in common. They contributed them to the family limited partnership. And as brothers are, are want to do, they didn't get along anymore. So they, they decided, that, okay, we're going to give uh, six, th three of the six lots to brother A and three of the six lots to brother B. Um, that was held to be a change in ownership because it was disproportional. To be proportional, you would have had to distribute 50% tenancy and common interest to all six lots to each brother. So if Michael and Gabriel aren't getting along anymore, you've got to be careful. And you can do this a couple of different ways to avoid this outcome, but you've got to be careful. Um, one of the things about this is, I'm not sure if you recognize that name. Anybody recognize the name Giannini? As I get older, less and less people recognize it. That was a founding family member, I believe, of B of A. B of A was founded by the Giannini's. Um, let's move on. Okay. So this slide derived from a court case in San Diego, Simon Fashion Valley Mall versus the County of San Diego. And uh, Simon was going to bring in a joint venture partner as to a 50% interest. And what did they do? Well, they did a deed. Mall Co. by deed, 100% of the real estate to the joint venture owned 50% by Mall Co. and 50% by the insurance company. Is that proportional? Nope. Change in ownership. Could they have done that a couple of different ways? You betcha. One way they could have done it was they could have deeded a 50% interest to, to the insurance company. Well, that would have been a transfer of a tendency and common interest, right? But what would have happened in that case? Would you have reappraised the whole thing? Or just half of it? Just half of it. Or you could have done this a different way. Malco to a single member LLC, where the single member is Malco, wait a while, and then sell insurance company a 50% stake in the LLC. Two ways. One of them, you could have halved your tax burden, additional tax burden, excuse me. The other, you could have avoided the increase altogether. All because what? They didn't talk to somebody. The whole key takeaway from that, if it's disproportional, you get 100% reassessment, and there's ways to avoid it. Okay, uh, affiliated corporation transfers. This has to do with transfers of real estate between entities in the same, under the same corporate parent. This is a very narrow exception, section 64B in the R&T code, and we don't see it very much because everybody in that chain, up and down, needs to be a corporation. It doesn't apply to LLCs or partnerships. So if they're all corporations, you can do it. But here's a good thing about this one you don't get original co-owner taint. And you're going to realize what that means in a second. You can do a section 64B and you don't get original co-owner taint. Let's move on. Okay, let's go back to the presumptions. We're transferring legal entity interest. Is that a change in ownership? What's the presumption? The presumption is no. Two giant exceptions. The first exception is what they call the change in control rule, which is a bit of a misnomer. It's really somebody got control. And the second is the original co-owner rule under section 64D. Let's move on. Section 64C1, obtaining direct or indirect control of a legal entity owning California real estate is a change in ownership. Let's go use your LLC hypo. LLC owns a piece of real estate. It's a single member LLC and a single, another single member buys all of that membership interests. That's a change in control because that entity received more than 50% of the interest in the LLC. Contrast, two buyers, 50% each. 
that would not be a change in control because nobody gets control. Okay, for control, when you're looking at corporations, you're looking at more than 50% of the voting stock. If you have a bunch of voting, st uh, if you have a lot of economic interest but a very narrow voting interest, you look at the voting shares. For our partnerships and anything taxed as a partnership like an LLC, you look at capital and profits accounts. Somebody obtaining more than 50% of the capital and more than 50% of the profits. Key thing about LLCs is we ignore managerial control. You can, can be the managing member and none of the members, other members could you know, oust you in theory, not necessarily, but in theory. And as long as you didn't have more than 50% of the capital and profits, you would not be in control for property tax purposes. Make sense? Move on. So in this situation, we got Swedish Car LLC on 50% by Dearborn and 50% by Bavarian. No change in control. Because even though somebody might have owned Swedish Car before, you sufficiently diluted the interest so no one got control. Uh, Dearborn could sell 25% of its interest to Tokyo and 25% to an A, not a change in ownership. Likewise, uh, Bavarian could transfer its 50% interest to Government Motors, and that would not be a change in ownership. So, you know, no change in ownership, even though all of the shares or membership interests in, in Swedish have transferred. You have to be careful, though, as you read this, you have to understand that you also need to analyze the other rule, the original co-owner rule, which can come back and bite you. We'll talk about that now. Okay, the original coroner rule. I had another slide with the statute on it. I'm gonna save you because it literally took the whole slide. This is probably one of the most complex concepts that I deal with in my, what I do. It's called the original coroner rule. And what it says, if you have a transfer to a legal entity that was excluded from reassessment under section 62A2, the proportional interest exclusion, Everybody who holds membership or legal entity interest in that entity after the transfer has this label, original co-owner. And what section 64D does is it forces you to track the interest in that entity. And when cumulatively more than 50% of those interests have transferred, that's a change in ownership. So it's several moving parts here, but let's use the example that I like. Um, mom and dad have a piece of real estate. They've saved up enough money, got the apartment building. They convey it to their trust. The tr their their uh, estate planner says, you really should have this in a legal entity. Why don't we set up a limited partnership for you? So they deed it to the limited partnership. And they each took back 50% each. So what do we have? Is that a proportional interest transfer? Mom and dad own 50% after, they own 50 before, 50% after, that's proportional. Do we reassess that? No. But they took advantage of the section 62A2 exclusion. And what does that mean? Afterwards, they have this label, original co-owner. And what section 64D says is that when the original co-owners cumulatively transfer more than 50% away, you have a change in ownership. So this is my hypo. Child one reaches the age of majority. They give child one a 20% interest in the legal entity. Is that more than 50%? Nope. Child two reaches the age of maturity. They give him 20%. Is that a change in ownership? Isabella reaches the age of maturity and they give Isabella 20%. Is that a change in ownership? Yes, because you've broken the 50% threshold. Let's go back a slide. Remember this case here? the Swedish car company in Ocean Avenue, that worked only because they were not original co-owners. If you have that original co-owner taint, you can't do that LLC interest transfer and give away 100% of the interest in that property without reassessment, if you have that taint. And the only way you get that taint is by making a proportional interest transfer to the legal entity. Let's move on. Oh, what's the general advice here? I, and, and it's not just me. Please, you know, I, I do not like the government getting things it shouldn't have gotten. Whenever you're thinking about filing a deed and creating it to a legal entity or to anybody, ask yourself, what's going to happen if I do this? Is it truly proportional? I'm giving it to a legal entity. Does it have, you know, 50-50 ownership or does it have 49-49 and you bring in a 2% manager? 
If you're bringing in the 2% manager, what are you just doing? You're shooting yourself in the foot and giving yourself a property tax reassessment. And if you had taken it to somebody who knows this stuff, they can help you to avoid this outcome. Even though that will, you, know, you wind up intended to give him that 5% interest until much later, the fact is, by putting it in the original partnership agreement, you're stuck with it. And you could give it to him later, just not then. Same with transferring legal entity interests. You know, my hypo about the parents with the three kids, that happens a lot. And the person who set that trust up or that legal entity didn't tell them what they were doing or that they were going to be saddled with this original co-owner status on their membership interests or limited partnership interests. Most attorneys don't know this stuff. And there's a few of you in the room here that, I, that do know it. Um, and, and please spread the word because this, this stuff is really important. And even though you don't intend these consequences, it happens all the time. I really enjoy doing what I do. If you have questions, please talk to me afterwards. Um, this is a very brief, uh, uh, um, abbreviated version of the talk I give. I give it at one, two, and three hour lengths. Uh, if you ever have any questions and you want to talk about this, please give me a call. Um, and, and a lot of the stuff, it's just a quick telephone call. I, I take the calls. Wes can reach me. Um, I'd be happy to help. Thank you so much. Thank you.